Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, all of you out there and all of these wonderful people out here, I'd mention where they're from, but I'll forget some, and then that wouldn't be nice, would it? Well, the question of the week is from a letter I got. I have to change a few things because I don't want anybody to know who wrote it or where they're from. Anyway, this woman has lost uh, several of her children to cystic fibrosis. And she said, you say on your show that we are to try to be holy. What does that mean? What does it mean? Huh? Right now it means I have to wipe my nose. <laughs> No. And the reason she says that is that so many people, she goes to prayer groups, she prays all the time. And, and she said, is doing all that I do, all that praying, is the road to holiness? Is that the road to holiness? Does God love them more? That I mean, people who pray, since they devote so much time to pray, well, let's answer a few things one at a time. In the first place, praying is a part of holiness. It's not the whole thing. Secondly, the Pharisees prayed a lot, didn't they? They fasted a lot. And, and we know what the Lord said about this man, who, the poor sinner in the back and the Pharisee in the front of the temple. And he said, oh, Lord, I thank you that, um, that I'm not like the rest of men. Ah, so far, not too bad. I fast twice a week. Very good. I give alms to the poor. Very good. And then he looked back and he said, well, I'm happy I'm not like that man. Oh, I lost it all. So the Lord asked the question. He said, which one of them went home justified? That means holy. And the one in the back, all he could say, he wouldn't even lift up his head to the temple, to the holy of holies. He said, oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. That man was holy. Sometimes our concept of holy is a little mixed up. I suppose because we read the lives of the saints, and that's wonderful. I encourage it. They ought to be our heroes, not these crazy rock groups. Um, but you see, what they don't tell you in the lives of the saints is all their faults. It seems like that seems to be you can't do that. They weren't perfect. Say, Jerome had an awesome temper. Boy awesome temper. He wrote terrible letters to St. Augustine. We didn't think he was a hot translator, you know. <laughs> He's always finding fault with his translation of the Bible. 
<clears throat> and then there was Philip Neri, who played jokes. I can take a joke once in a while. I mean, he never stopped. <laughs> if you went to confession to him, he'd give you odd penances. <laughs> like, one time this man went to confession, I guess he was a little bit on the, pride, the proud side, and, and he made him walk through the village with a little dog on a leash, wrapped in a fur coat <laughs> in the middle of summer, and the coat was inside out. <laughs> I'd go to confession to that priest once. <laughs> and you can forget the rest of it. <laughs> and, and even when he was very, very holy, and one day he used to ele be elevated during Mass. You know, his, he was so in ecstasy during Mass that his, the, whole, the whole of it would just rise and people would sit there watching him just going up, and he hated that. And so we decided to do something that would prevent him from going into an ecstasy during Mass. So he put a squirrel on his shoulder, and he walked into Mass dressed in magnificent vestments with a squirrel on his shoulder. Well, I don't know about you. I would have said something, done something, or walked out. I would have said, what's wrong with him? Well, he did it as a distraction, you see. It didn't work. He went up and the squirrel with it. <laughs> the squirrel went with him. Then there was Brother Juniper, the wonderful, humble Franciscan brother in the time of St. Francis. And uh, this very prominent woman came in her carriage to the monastery looking for the holy man Juniper. And he saw her coming in the distance, and he saw two kids playing seesaw. And he got one off and put it on that side with the two on one side. He got on the other side, and he was going up and down. And so the woman stopped, and she said, could you tell me who and where is Brother Juniper? He said, I am, madam. He kept on. <laughs> and he, she said, well, may I speak to you? He said, go ahead. <laughs> well, she got so disgusted, she walked off at this idiot. But he was a holy man, you see. Sometimes I think we, we judge people by their actions. Most of the time, we say, well, that's all I have to judge by. Well, true, true. But our dear Lord told us not to judge. That's a part of holiness. Now, we're talking about holiness. A part of holiness is not to judge, and to keep your eyes on Jesus. I would say to this lady, you're doing fine. Keep on praying. What's a guilt-ridden Catholic to do? Why are you guilt-ridden? Because your, some of your children died? You were not the cause of their death? You were like Our Lady, who had to see child after child die. That is nothing to be guilty about. Well. I try not to think of my kids and how they suffered and died. Maybe because I didn't pray enough. No, don't do that. Don't put that kind of burden on your heart. God permitted them to have this disease, and he took them at the time it was best for them. You have to look at it. You have to look at it from the eyes of Mary. See? 
Our Lady didn't stand at the foot of the cross and strike her breast and say, oh, what did I do wrong? She knew what was going to happen to Jesus when she said, be it done to me according to thy will. <sighs> I am depressed. We are to depend on God and get rid of other kinds of crutches. So I hesitate. I hesitate to take medication for depression. Why are you depressed? Well, let me give you my little opinion. You have not really given your children to the Lord. What made Mary stand at the foot of the cross? Her total giving of Jesus to the Father. Why don't you do that tonight? See? Why don't you say, Jesus, I give you my children. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you for them. I thank you for the pain they had because they saved many souls. Now, you're not going to feel that way. It doesn't matter. You can feel good by eating a candy bar, you know? That doesn't matter. The words are not because they come from your will. They come from the reality you really want to give. You continue praying. It won't bring your children back but it'll keep you close to Jesus. Go to Our Lady. She knows what it is. She has gone through every kind of pain. See, every kind of pain. And you had a real sorrow, just like Our Lady has a real sorrow, or had one. But her eyes was on Jesus. She kept her eyes on Jesus. I have a little part of scripture that I was reading today. And I want to tell you what happened to the apostles when they kept their eyes off of Jesus. These men were human. <coughs> and they're portrayed as human. Sometime our saints, you feel they were saintly from the age three. And you lose hope. See? You don't ever lose hope at these men. Now, I'm going to just read some of this to you. And then you're going to find out what mistake they made because you and I make the same mistake. Now, we're in Mark. Uh, Mark 6, chapter 30th verse. If you got your scriptures with you. It says... He said, you must come away to some lonely place all by yourselves and rest a while. This is after John the Baptist's head just came up. They were depressed, depressed. And so the Lord said, come away and rest a while. Isn't it amazing that our dear Lord himself felt it necessary to just kind of pull away from the crowds, from the politics, from the noise, from the apostles themselves. Sometime he would get up at dawn and go up a mountain and pray by himself. And now he says to the apostles, it's time to pray. You know what a part of holiness is? Going somewhere, even if it's in your home. When the kids are in school, your husband's gone. Just go to a room sometime all by yourself and pray. Now some of you say, yeah, my husband's retired. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to every room I go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do then? <laughs> we'll sit him down and say, let's pray. <laughs> He'll either move <laughs> or go to the drugstore or something. <laughs> 
if he stays, that's wonderful. Now, so, there were so many coming and going that the apostles had no time to eat. <laughs> I would find that very hard. <laughs> I get grouchy if I'm hungry. That's just being Italian, that's all. So they went off in a boat to a lonely place where they could be by themselves. You got the picture now? They already had it. They're already tired. They're irritable and they're hungry. You got all that? So they get in the boat. They're going to go someplace where there are no people. But the people saw them going. And they guessed where they were going. And they got there before they did. <laughs> they hurried on foot. So when he stepped ashore, don't you see, by, don't, can't you see Peter say, ah. Oh. Oi, oi, oi. They're here. And probably one of the other apostles said, yeah, I told you they'd come. <laughs> Thomas would have said, I told you we should have gone the other direction. <laughs> oh, wait, this is really good. Now you're going to learn about holiness. So, Jesus stepped ashore and he saw the large crowd. He took pity on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Oh, we got a lot of that today. A lot of sheep. They have a wolf sometimes dressed like a sheep, but they're not. They're not sheep. And he said, he set himself to teach them at some length. Now, you see, they haven't eaten yet, hardly. You know, don't, don't miss the whole picture. You're going to miss a point. <laughs> By now, it's getting very late. Now, all day long, these men have not eaten. And the disciples came up to him and said, this is a lonely place. Isn't that funny how you put reasons for doing something when they're really your own? They weren't going to up and said, Master, we're hungry. They said, no, this is a lonely place, Lord. It's getting late. Let's send them away so they can go to the farms and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, I'm sure they weren't thinking of themselves at all. Do you see yourself in that? Huh? Do you? It's like fixing a meal just for you and your husband, and he brings home two buddies. <laughs> and you look at him like, <laughs> Now, you got this picture of these irritable apostles feigning charity for others. Why, they themselves are hungry. And he says, give them something to eat yourself. <sighs> How do you like that for adding? <laughs> and they answered. Oh, they're getting smart, Alec. Did you ever know when you get hungry, you get smart, Alec? <laughs> you come home, dinner ready? No. Why not? Because I had to go downtown today. How long is it going to take? An hour. An hour? You expect me to wait here an hour? Give me something to eat. <laughs> that's, a, that's a disposition these holy men were in. And so they get smart out. Are we to go and spend 200 denarii on bread for them to eat? <laughs> Isn't that hysterical? First, they want to get rid of the crowd. Now the Lord says, give them something to eat. They see their own food going down the drain. We got to spend our money to feed this crowd? And our Lord never even answered them. It wasn't worth it. He said, how many loaves have you? Go and see. Well, they didn't have any. They said, 
five and two fish. So he ordered them to get all the people together in groups on the green grass <coughs> sat them down on the ground oh here comes it oh wait till I tell you this one <laughs> my asthma's bad so you have to bear with me in squares of hundreds and fifties Let's see how many here tonight, quite a bit. And now, let's say all of our crew hadn't eaten all day today. I'm about to give the little bit they got away. And I say, look, put all these people in squares. Squares. Uh, 50 of them at a time. <coughs> well, a square is like so. So, okay, this crowd, come over here, this way. <coughs> and then Peter says, John, how many you got? <laughs> I got 58. Give me eight over here. <laughs> over there. <coughs> Thomas, why are you taking them all over there? I don't have enough over here. Here, take some of mine. I bet somebody say, why we got to sit in the squares? <laughs> Wouldn't you ask me that? Why you want me to sit in the squares? Can't you feed me the way I'm sitting? <laughs> <coughs> and see, everybody's irritable. Now the crowd's irritable. <clears throat> then he took the five loaves and the two fish, raised his eyes to heaven, said a blessing. Everybody's waiting. What's he going to do? Knowing a little bit about human nature, I would say 90% of them weren't waiting at all. They were thinking, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. A little kid cries out, Mama, why are we sitting like this? <laughs> I don't know. Why are we? Shut up, will you? I don't know. <laughs> the apostles are thinking the same thing. The, now, what comes here? Here's one of the greatest occasions, one of the greatest miracles in the scriptures. They're almost missing it. Oh, wait till I get to the end of this thing. He gave a blessing, broke the loaves, and handed them to his disciples and distributed them. Then he shared the fish. They ate as much as they wanted. 5,000. They collected 12 baskets. Now, in another place, in St. Luke and Matthew, also John, it says, that they had fed 5,000 and they had another seven baskets, I think it was in another place, another miracle, of scraps. In, Saint, uh, in, in another place it said there was tall grass there, tall grass. And the Lord said to them, pick up the scraps. Did you ever sit in tall grass? Did you ever sit in tall grass? Squash. Now he didn't say pick up the whole fish, pick up the untouched lobes, scraps. Do you know what a scrap is? You don't know what a scrap is? It's a third of a piece of bread, a half a piece of bread. You know how kids eat bread? <laughs> Pick up 
pick up the scraps, the Lord said. And they filled 12 baskets. Do you know, my friends, this is one point of holiness we miss completely. Why? For the simple reason that we don't count the little things in our life as a point of holiness. See? Tiny little things. The things that you do every day that are small and irritating. Irritating. Waiting for doctors, waiting for dentists. Uh, a tire blows out when you're in a hurry and you've got to pull off the highway and nobody pays any attention to you. Even getting out of bed in the morning. Some people are night people, some people are morning people. Some people don't wake up till about 6 p.m. <laughs> and they're rare to go. You woke up at 4. There's little things. Going to a restaurant and the soup tastes terrible. So you eat it. Going for a picnic and it rains. Little things. And you see, the problem is we don't keep our eyes on Jesus. We don't keep our eyes on Jesus. See, that's what happened to these apostles. I want to just read you the rest of this little thing because you're going to see yourself more and more. These were praying men. These were men who were next to Jesus, his, his physical body, for three years. And they had all of these little irritating things that happened to them. And they happened to you. Their occasions, their opportunities, they're not, they're not time for impatience, lack of compassion, or anything else. Here, so they finally left. He made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him. Why, he, he could see they're at a breaking point. See? So he said, look, you go on the boat, you go on the other side, I'll meet you there. I'll, I'll dismiss the crowd. They had had it. All right. After saying goodbye, he went to the hills to pray. When evening came, a boat was far out in the lake, and he was alone on the land. So here's the apostles, and there's Jesus way up here. He could see. Now, I want you to hear this. The woman who just wrote has the opinion, I think, you're feeling more, that Jesus doesn't see her plight, that Jesus doesn't care. But that's not true. Listen to what happened. He could see they were worn out with rowing, and the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch, do you imagine he watched there from the top of a hill and watch them roll against the wind till the fourth watch? So obviously, there's something very good for us when he doesn't answer, but he still looks, he still sees, he still knows. Well, so, he came towards them walking on the lake. He was going to pass them by. Here's another point of holiness. When you get disheartened and you get discouraged, when you think like this dear woman that God has not heard your prayer or God is angry with you, call out to him. He, he pretended he was going to pass them by. And all this storm and rain and the, the boat was sinking. They were going in circles. He pretended. Why? He wanted them to say, 
they cried out to him, terrified, Lord, save us. And then he said, courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Now you see, but this dear lady and all of you there, all of you here, when it looks like our Lord is not listening, he's listening. When it looks like he is not seeing, he is seeing. And it looks like he's trying to pass you by, he isn't. He wants you to cry out, Lord, help me. Save me. And he said, courage, it is I, do not be afraid. You must recall these words when things get so tough and so impossible to bear. He sees you, pray, call out to him, and you will hear, do not be afraid. It is I, have courage. Now, this is what's so important for you and I. He got into the boat with them, and the wind dropped. They were dumbfounded. Now, why were they frightened? Why were they dumbfounded? Why were they afraid? Here's the answer for them, for you and me. They were dumbfounded and afraid, and they lost courage because they had not seen what the miracle of the loaves meant. Their minds were closed. What closed the minds of the apostles to the miracle of the loaves? They were agitated about themselves. They were hungry. They were tired of the crowds. They ceased to keep their eyes on Jesus. Their eyes were on each other, their eyes were on the crowd, their eyes were on the people. They had already worked 24 hours and now they're at it again. See what happened? Don't we all do that? huh? Don't we all just look at what's wrong and look at what's all the horrible things? Go we take our eyes off of Jesus. And even on that lake, Even on the lake, they couldn't believe it. Was he was walking on the water. They had not seen what the miracle meant, and their minds were closed. If you and I do not become holy, it will not be because we didn't have all the opportunities, all the time, we had time to pray, we had time to accept our crosses and make our sacrifices. If, if we don't become holy, it's because the distractions of the world, the politics, the politicians, the trials, the problems in our family, the problems around us, we're just like the apostles. That's what occupies our mind 24 hours a day. We go to bed with it and we wake up with it. They fail to see Jesus. Their minds were closed. And our Lord says that very thing about the last day, and they will come to me and say, when did we see thee hungry and cold? When we did not feed thee, when was it that we did not clothe you? And he said, I will say to them, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Their eyes were closed. They could not see the image of Jesus in their neighbor. Well, we're going for 
a little break so I can drink some good cold water. And then we'll be back in just a minute with your phone calls. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Racine, Wisconsin. And what is your question? I would like you to pray for my son who uh, took his life here Sunday. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, he hung himself, and if, if, if you could have your audience and pray for him and, and then offer up their next communion, I, I'd be very grateful. How old was he? He was 33, 33, Mother. I'm sorry. I would think that of all the ways a person can die, that would be the hardest for them and those they leave behind. Let me address you first. Uh, it is an awesome cross. The first thing you don't want to do is to put a, a guilt on yourself. Even if there were differences or whatever, you must put it behind you. Say, God, I'm sorry. I, maybe I should have done more. But I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. The second thing is to put a lot of love into the rest of your family. A lot of love. Because there's a special sense of loss. Uh, when someone commits suicide. It's the most painful uh, kind of death. Third, do not despair. We know that suicide is self-murder. We know it's wrong whether it's personal or assisted, is wrong and sinful, very sinful. But we do not know the inner workings of that mind. And so we must depend upon the mercy of God. We must depend on the mercy of God. We cannot presume those who want to commit suicide. You cannot presume that if you do this, you're going right to heaven or, or God will have mercy and you can't presume that. But you and I, who are the victims left behind, must depend upon the mercy of God. One of the attributes of God, one of the wonderful attributes of God is that to God, all things are now. There is no yesterday and no tomorrow. When your son died, our Lord saw your tears now. He saw your broken heart. He saw your pain. And I think he would give your son that one last chance. To say, I'm sorry, Lord. I didn't know. You loved me. In today's society where we run after pleasure, we run after this, we run after that. And then there are those who don't really build our faith but destroy it. 
When people are in dire trouble and despair, they have no place to go if we don't tell them about Jesus. We're going to say a little prayer before you and for your son. Lord God, you alone know all things. You alone know whether this boy was totally responsible, whether he knew what he was doing. You alone know the heart and the mind. And though he committed a grave sin, your mercy, Lord, is great. Lord, tonight we pray for all those who contemplate suicide for the terrible risk they take of losing sight of thee for all eternity. Give them light to see this is not not a path to, to take. Give this man and his family the courage to accept this great cross. Draw them closer to you because of it and use it, Lord, to make them holy as you are holy. We ask that Mary, our mother, comfort them as only she can. Amen. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. And where are you from? I'm from Miami, Florida. And what is your question? Um, uh, my son, when he was 14, had a spinal cord injury. Would you talk a little louder, please? Uh, my son, when he was 14, had a spinal cord injury, and he's now 20 years of age and has completely turned away from his faith. And I pray constantly that... Um, he finds his way back to Jesus. Is he, is he bitter? Um, well, he was left a quadriplegic, and I'm sure that he is. Yeah. And where other doors have closed, others have opened for him. And um, he, I just see no return for him. And my prayers through Mary to Jesus yeah. are endless. Yeah, you see, these kind of things are things thrust on us sometimes by the wrong decisions of somebody in a car or alcoholic or drunk or maybe a car just gets out of control. But here is a treasure that, you know, a diamond was at one time a piece of coal. I don't think there's anything as ugly as a piece of coal. And yet by pressure, constant pressure, unbelievable pressure, this ugly piece of coal is crushed into a diamond. Well, a lot of people get that pressure. But it's only because our dear Lord wants to make something of them greater than anybody else. The blind will see things you and I won't see in his kingdom. The lame will run. The deaf will hear music you and I won't hear. We will all be made new. I wish your son were listening. And I could tell him about the day when he will get off of that chair and run all around heaven. And he will see God face to face. Oh, he will have some years here in Maine, pain and misery. But what is to come will more than make up for it. Tell him that. He may not want to listen because we're all people of the here and now, but the here and now isn't too hot sometimes, you know? We must all keep our eyes on Jesus. You and I, the whole world. If we don't, 
I don't care who you are or where you are, you'll go astray. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Yes, Mother, New York, New York State. I would like to, to ask you, Mother, I have had many problems in my life, and uh, I have not lost my faith. I always turned especially to the Blessed Mother. Mm -hmm. My question will be right now, Mother, what do you do when uh, your son knows the most beautiful human being comes to you and tells you that he's gay? Hmm. What, what is your question, though? Your, your son told you he was gay? <sighs> That's a cross. That's a cross. Because it kind of leaves you in the air, doesn't it, huh? You just don't know what to do. You love him, and yet you know what he's doing is it's very wrong. You must love him and pray. Pray. He won't listen to your words, perhaps. There was so much AIDS in the world and oh, the, the, the lung problems that are coming with AIDS, uh, TB, uh, so many things. But it is not beyond redemption. No matter what he is now, it's wrong, you must tell him that, but you must love him. And that's what's so hard with all of us. We tend to hate the sin and the sinner. And it's hard to, to separate the sin from the sinner. St. Hmm? Peter was a great sinner. He, he denied his Lord. Uh, and our dear Lord did not say to him, I do not choose you, you disappointed me. He still chose him, huh? Um, this young boy is just going in with the crowd because it's so accepted. See? So accepted. And you, they make you feel guilty. Number two, what God calls him to is a celibate life unless he gets married. You have to tell him that. Whenever we wish, misuse anything of God's gift to us, we destroy it. If you buy a new car and you put a nail in the tire, you're not going very far, you see. You can't take anything they make, anything you buy today, and, and misuse it and expect it to last. It's the same with our body. Whether you drink yourself to death, or smoke yourself to death, or drug yourself to death, or sex yourself to death, especially being homosexual, an active homosexual, the action is sinful. But he is still a man made to the image and likeness of God. Love him. Never let him think for a moment you accept his lifestyle. You cannot do that. That would be misdirected compassion. But love him and pray. Pray. That at some point in his life, he will know it's wrong. It's against his own nature. And we will pray to for all of those who are called tonight with such heavy crosses, know that your eternal glory and your eternal happiness will be greater, greater because of them. And know 
that even though many times we suffer unjustly, so did he. Many times when we look at the world and the world hates us because we are Christian, because we believe in morality and truth and doctrines and dogmas and faith, even though they hate us for that, we must dance for joy for they treated him the same way. We are not greater than the master. And we must, you can learn from tonight, from the apostles, from our callers, from each one of us listening. Keep your eyes on Jesus. It may seem hard in a difficult road, but the benefits are eternal everlasting. And so tonight, I wish you all great holiness. I wish you great graces from God that will enable you always to make the right choice, His choice, not your choice, but His. We are all for God, so we are pro-choice. God's choice. <laughs> we are for the Lord. We give him what he asks for with a cheerful heart. Can't always be happy over it. I would like to sit here tonight with clear voice and forget about cold water and asthma machines and cough drops slurping in my mouth. But it is not the will of God. So what have I got to do? Go to bed? No way. <laughs> I sit before you with those small handicaps so we can all keep our eyes on Jesus. And one day, we shall all be together in his kingdom. And you'll come to me and say, you know, I remember the day you talked about holiness. Changed my life around. And I'll say to you, no. He spoke about holiness, and he changed your life around. If you're not a Catholic anymore, come home. God bless you.